And at the end of 10 minutes, the trap door opens and I fall through it. <laughs> Isaiah 42, 21 says, it, the Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. First question we want to ask of that verse is, why is God pleased to magnify his law and make it glorious? And the most important reason is that the law of God is a reflection of his own character. Now we think of the law of God as commandments, but those commandments are given to us in order that we might reflect his character in our own lives. That's why Peter in, um, in 1 Peter chapter 1 says, 1 15, 16, but as he who calls you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. God wants us to be like him in our character, and that's why he's given us his law, because his law reflects his own character, and he wants us, through the commandments of the law, to reflect his character also. Now, in Isaiah 42, the context of Isaiah 42, 21, is that the people are not reflecting the character of God. They're not honoring and magnifying the law of God. They are flagrantly disobedient. In fact, uh, the words that he used, they're blind and they're deaf, and so they're dishonoring the law. And that seems like kind of a strange context. And, and verse 21 just sort of appears out of nowhere because the before and after is the disobedience of the nation of Israel. And then just right in it is this one sentence, the Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. So how is God going to do this? God is not going to let the nation of Israel or us just disregard his law, and so the law is sort of thrown to the side. God will magnify his law and make it glorious, and he will do this by sending his son. 700 years will elapse before this transpires, but God here in Isaiah 42 is saying, you people are dishonoring my law, but I'm going to honor it. Whatever you do, I'm going to honor it. And I'm going to honor it by sending my son to do that. Now, any law has what we might call commands and sanctions or commands and penalties for disobedience. In fact, um, an easy way to remember that is just two Ps, precepts and penalties. The law has precepts, the commandments, and it has penalties for the disobedience. Now, the fact is all laws have precepts and penalties. Uh, the precept of the speed limit law as you will drive, not over, say, we'll pick a number, 55 miles an hour. That's the commandment. And if you conscientiously keep your car within that speed limit, you are thereby honoring that law. If you break the law and the highway patrol sees you, then they will stop you and you will pay a fine and you'll get four points deducted off of your driver's license. That's the penalty. And the law has been honored by exacting that penalty from you. So you either honor the law by keeping its precepts or you honor the law by suffering its sanctions, its penalty. We either do one or the other. We either obey and honor or we disobey and we honor through the sanctions. But as we know, Jesus Christ did both. He came and he perfectly obeyed the law. I brought out yesterday in our session that he lived to 33 years and was absolutely perfect in his righteousness. He honored God's law by his obedience. But then he died on the cross in our place. He suffered the penalty that we deserved. And so in our case, we either obey or we suffer the penalty. And in the grace of Christ, he did both because he was our representative 
both in his sinless life and in his sin-bearing death. And so God's law was magnified through the work of Christ. Now, I use the word gospel a lot. But when I use it, and technically the word gospel simply is a message of good news. But I use the word gospel as a shorthand expression for the entire work of Christ, his sinless life, his death on the cross, his resurrection and ascension, and then all the fruit that flows out of that. And so we can say that God's law was magnified through the gospel. So what is our response to this? Well, we can sit back and say, well, Jesus did it all. So there's nothing more for us to do. But this is not the way the Christian life works. I want to turn in my Bible to Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3 is Paul's testimony about his own life. And it was a sterling testimony. In all of uh, Paul's uh, testimony here in Philippians 3, 4 through 6. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Even when he says, I persecuted the church, he thought he was doing God a favor. And so he, he has, you might say, an impeccable record. But then he says in, in um, verses 7 through 9, he counted it all as loss. He threw it all away that he might be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And so Paul says, I'm resting in the perfect righteousness of Christ. But he wasn't fully resting because as we continue on into verses 12 to 13, he's talking about uh, perfection and he says, not that I've already attained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make my own because Christ Jesus made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider my, that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul has just been talking about finding his righteousness completely in Christ. And yet, in this passage, he is pursuing it with a passion. The two words, press on, and the, the word press on is a very intense word. In fact, in other places in the Bible, it's translated as the word persecute, which you would know would be a very intense word. And then the picture of straining forward. This is a runner running the race and straining every muscle and tendon that's in him to be the one to break the tape. And so Paul was very intense about living the Christian life. Why was Paul intense about living the Christian life? Because he was consumed by the gospel. He couldn't take his mind off the gospel. And because of that, because he enjoyed being found righteous in Christ Jesus, he wanted to be found, though imperfectly, righteous in his own conduct. The gospel, rightly understood, and the gospel appreciated, will always motivate us, and I don't hesitate to use the word drive us, to be in our practice what we are in our standing before God. Even though we know that we will always be imperfect, we will always come up short, we will always be seeking that. The more you appreciate the gospel, the more you will press on to live a life that exemplifies the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love to us in the gospel. Thank you that you magnified your law and made it glorious through the work of the Lord Jesus, both in his obedience and in his suffering. Thank you that he did that on our behalf. And Father, may we be 
excited about the gospel, and be motivated to live it out in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have six Amen. seconds left. Thank you, Jerry.